All right, good morning. Oh, thanks. <laughs> First person actually saying good morning back. Um, are there any questions about previous lecture? So we're down to four more lectures on evolution. Um, and today, what I want to talk about is uh, speciation. So let me just start off the, the lecture with some, a couple observations, OK? So the, the goal, like I said, is to talk about speciation and specifically what the model is for how species form. How do we actually think species form today? And the, the idea is actually a fairly old one. So Darwin had some ideas on how species form. In fact, his book is titled On the Origin of Species. And it's a remarkable fact that even though the book is called On the Origin of Species, most of the time he talks about natural selection, this process that leads to organisms becoming adapted to their environment. Right? He actually doesn't talk a lot about uh, how species form. And the, what he does talk about is part of the model we now believe today. That is to say, Darwin's belief was that species form when, um, when groups become isolated one from the other. And his view of speciation was purely morphological. So he was, he was interested in how these morphological differences, how differences in traits evolve in different groups. Now, the, the modern view, remember we talked about the, the biological species concept, which is that organisms are reproductively isolated one from the other. So the modern view also has to account for how organisms become reproductively isolated one from the other. Now, here's an example where, where reproductive isolation isn't perfect, right? So I'm going to start off with some you know, the cases where we know something went very, very wrong. And so here's an example of something going very, very wrong. You had a male lion mating with a female tiger, and you produced a what's called a liger. Okay, there's an example. Here's another example you might be familiar with. Mules. Um, these are uh, offspring of a male donkey and a female horse. They're infertile, okay, so they can't produce young, but they're very, you know, robust beasts. In fact, they're, they're used, they're, they're deliberately bred because they're good pack animals. And I don't know if you know this, but the hinny is just the opposite cross. So you take a female donkey and mate with a male horse, and you get a hinny out. I think, I think a tie-on is a female lion with a male tiger. But. And here's an example of a zebroid, where you take a female horse and a male zebra, and you get a hybrid form. Okay, so these are just examples I wanted to start off with, just to get you a little bit interested in, in formation of species. Whenever we see these, these instances in nature, we realize, like I said, something didn't go right, right? That the reproductive isolation wasn't complete and that some organisms made a mistake. And it's actually quite a severe mistake in these cases because if you're a female donkey and a male horse and you produce an offspring, you know, that your offspring are infertile. So basically, your fitness is quite low in that case. So natural selection should favor organisms choosing the right mates, you know, the mates of the right species at least. So let me blank the screen, the screen up. Like I promised, everything, things are going to be more on the board now. So let's, let's go back to the main observation, which is today we have many millions of species alive, okay? All of which, you know, the, the, which are distinct one from the other, reproductively isolated one from the other for the most part. And we think that those species are related to one another through some, or we know that they're related to one another through some unknown evolutionary tree. So here's an example of an evolutionary tree. And the similarities in how organisms, you know, the similarities in their features among living organisms leads us to believe that there was a single common ancestor that lived many billions of years ago, maybe three billions of years ago. So for instance, all, all organisms on Earth share um, a, the genetic code. They have a common way of coding for uh, DNA, coding for amino acids and proteins. They also share a common mechanism for translating the DNA into proteins. These are things that all organisms on, on Earth share that leads us to believe that there is a common ancestor of all life. Now, the, the point being, if, if you start off with one species three billion years ago, and now you have millions, the, the, the main process that, that generates that diversity is speciation. That's what we call it. We call this process of splitting speciation And this process, again, is what I want to talk about today. Now, if you blow up what happens here, so this is time, with this being the most recent, this being the distant in, in the past, we imagine we have some population that diverges. So you have 
some individuals going off into one population and the other individuals going off into another population, and that there's some barrier to gene flow between those two populations. When we talk about population genetics, we talked about the you know, four different mechanisms that change allele frequencies, but gene flow was the process in which individuals migrate between populations. So you need to have some, pop, some process whereby you have two populations and you don't have gene flow occurring anymore. So you turn off gene flow. And this, what, this mechanism in which you, we turn off gene flow, so we might imagine there's some barrier to gene flow that occurs right here. This is the barrier to gene flow. And there'll be two different mechanisms that cause barriers to gene flow that I will discuss. One are uh, called allopatric speciation. And the other one we'll discuss is sympatric speciation. So let's talk about, about the, a barrier to gene flow that's an allopatric mechanism first. Um, so we're going to imagine we have some population. So here's our population, and I guess the axes here, are, you know, there's north. Uh, so we're, we're looking at a map. We're looking at the distribution of the species on a map. And an allopatric one, one allopatric mechanism that we'll discuss is called a vicariant event. So what is a vicariant event? That is a barrier that occurs dividing a population into two. Okay, so you have a climatic change, or uh, you have a river forms, perhaps, you know, that divides up, a, divides up a population. There's many different ways you can physically separate a population into two. But the point here is in a vicariant uh, type of process, you divide this population into two, and it's important that this barrier actually turns off gene flow. So not only does it divide the population into two, but it prevents individuals from this side to getting to this side, and vice versa. You're turning, this, this vicariant event is turning off gene flow. And there's a number of, number of ways in which this could occur. So for instance, um, well, here's an example. Let me see if I can, here's California. There's the Gulf of Mexico. And you come down here, there's South America. And South America comes up here. You have some complicated thing here. There's my map of the world, at least the Western Hemisphere. So there's North America. There's South America. Yeah, it's about as well as I can draw that. But you know that the Panama Canal is about here, and this is called, this area here is called the Isthmus of Panama. Well, until quite recently, at least geologically speaking, there was a, you know, there was a, a strait here. You could actually, the water flew, you know, there was a, there was a water barrier between North and South America. And when the, when the uh, oceans lowered, this isthmus popped up above the, uh, above the ocean. And this, this isthmus of Panama, before it was a barrier to gene flow between North and South America, when it was there. But once it popped up, it was actually a barrier to gene flow between organisms that lived in the Caribbean and those that lived in the Pacific. And I will give an example of pairs of species on either side of, there's many pairs of marine organisms on either side of, the, of this um, barrier, which are what are called sister species. They're each other's closest relatives. With the idea being that this barrier caused a division in the population that separated populations one from the other and caused them to speciate over time. So that would be an example of a vicariant event. Yes? Anything that, that would divide a population into two, I would say, would be a fair game. Most people think about, you know, abiotic events being the cause, but you can probably imagine other scenarios. Just as long as you're separating the population geographically. Any other questions? Okay. Another type of um, allopatric event I want to talk about, we can term a founder event. Now, we spoke about founder events when we spoke about, when I talked about um, genetic drift, right? That's, that's the idea that you have some big population, so big population, and then you form, or you, you form a new population uh, from just a few individuals. 
And the point that I made when we were talking about genetic drift is that the individuals that form the small population are a random sample of the individuals from the big population. So there's a good chance that they'll just happen to carry some rare or unusual combination of alleles. And I gave an example in lecture of, of a, an elevated rate of Huntington's disease in a population in Argentina. But let's imagine that this big population is actually the mainland. Maybe it's a continent such as South America, and out here we have an island that j had just recently poked its head above the ocean. So a lot of these islands in the Pacific or Atlantic, for instance, are caused by um, volcanoes that are on the, surface, on the bottom of the ocean, and as the volcanoes grow and grow, eventually they pop up above the, the surface of the water. And so when they pop up above the surface of the water, what that means is you have new land, new, a new environment for organisms to colonize. So if you have a fortuitous colonization event by, say, a bird or a turtle or a lizard, th they can found a new population on this island. Okay? And the idea here is that, first of all, as you know, genetic drift will be a factor causing this population to diverge from its, from its founding population. Okay? The second thing you should note is that if this distance is large enough, that these, that the, the population can be effectively isolated from the mainland population. Yes, of course, it, it did, did, was founded by a, a, you know, a founding event, you know, colonization event from a few individuals, but these can be very rare. You know, in terms of, you know, once every thousand years you might have a successful colonization event. But given enough time, of course, it's almost certain to occur. But once these, once these small populations are founded, they can become, they're essentially reproductively isolated from the mainland population. So, so this would be an allopatric event in that sense, that gene flow is no longer occurring between the two. And secondly, it's likely that these organisms are going to find themselves in a completely new habitat, where things like the temperature, the other organisms they're competing against, uh, uh, the food sources, whatever, are likely to differ quite dramatically from what the conditions were on the mainland. And so natural selection will also play a role in causing this population to diverge from its parental population. Once again, this is just talking about the barriers that can disrupt populations and turn off gene flow. And so in an allopatric model, you can think of vicariance, dividing some, some factor dividing the, the population into two, or you can imagine you know, new organisms being founded, um, new populations being founded by just a few, few uh, colonizers. And this is the type of mechanism we think occurs in, in places like the Hawaiian Islands or the Galapagos Islands, where, yes, go ahead. There is a geographical barrier, it's the, the ocean <laughs> that separates them. It's a form of allopatric speciation. So we're, I'm just trying to give you some different flavors of how things can be isolated from one another. Well, vicariance, you usually think of the population sitting there and then something dividing it, whereas this is part of the population moves to an, a new place. It's a founder event. And, and just to talk a little bit about these islands, you know, I mentioned, I believe, when we are talking about the Galapagos, that things like the organisms like the turtles, that they're the Galapagos tortoises that occur on these islands. Their closest relatives are found in South America. So remember, this is Ecuador. There's the Galapagos Islands. The closest relatives of the Galapagos tortoises are found on on the mainland, the, the, the closest relatives of the birds, the finches, the, the Darwin finches that live on the Galapagos are also found on the mainland. So the, the evolutionary tree of the organisms that you, know, you find on these islands often supports that the colonization was from the nearby mainland, okay, and that you had some sort of radiation of new species on those islands. And it's, there's nothing to say that you know, when you have multiple islands, like you do in the Hawaiian Islands or the Galapagos Islands, you, know, you, have a, you can have a colonization event on one of them, and then you can have individuals hopping from one island to another. So you can actually repeat this process on a much smar smaller scale and get even more species, as you do on the Galapagos or the Hawaiian Islands, forming in these small, isolated I archipelagos. Now, is there anything else I want to talk about this? Oh, there's <coughs> there are some interesting observations that people have made, for instance, that support the idea that you know, these types of colonization events can occur. So for instance, when you have storms, uh, does it, everybody here know what a mangrove forest is? Okay, so the mangrove forest you find you know, in the south, you know, 
uh, closer to the equator. You don't find them around here. But they're basically forests uh, that form right, you know, a, a plants, mangroves that form right along the coastal regions. When you have these big storms, what you can actually do is they can actually rip up portions of these mangrove forests. And you get these kind of, uh, here's the water. You get these floating rafts of sort of a mat of mangrove trees. And often people, when they find these out in the ocean, they'll actually find like a, some poor lizard. There's a poor lizard, you know, hanging out on the mangrove raft, right? Or other organisms as well, but lizards are a common thing to find. You know, just an unfortunate lizard that happened to be on a mangrove that was swept out to sea. Now, most of these rafts and the, and the, and the lizards on them probably don't, you know, aren't so lucky as to find a new island, but occasionally the idea is that you, know, you can actually have some lucky lizard land on an island, right? And, and can, in principle, form a new population. So there are some observations that support this. And of course, Darwin was also quite interested in whether or not you could have dispersal, long distance dispersal of seeds and plants across, uh, you know, in, in salt water. So he was doing these, these experiments where he dropped seeds of various types into salt water and asked if, they could, if they'd actually germinate after, you know, a month or two months or three months in in salt water, with the idea being, once again, that you can have plants also colonizing these islands just by their, their seeds floating around in the, in the ocean water and eventually washing up on the shores. Okay, is there anything else I wanted to say about allopatric speciation? I don't believe so. Oh, and just a little bit more about by, about what these, the nature of these barriers. So, you know, as humans, we think of barriers as having to be pretty dramatic before they could actually cause a disruption to gene flow. But it really depends on the biology of the organism. What might seem like a, a trivial barrier to us, say a, a small stream uh, that, you know, just, that just happened to have formed a creek even, can be a, a large barrier to another organism, such as a snake or some other organism that can't swim. Right? So there's some organisms see what we might think of as trivial barriers to dispersal as insurmountable barriers. Okay, so, so keep in mind that, um, that the habitat can be divided in ways that we can't necessarily recognize easily, but the organisms themselves recognize as being quite substantial barriers to gene flow or dispersal. So the, the nature of the vicariant event or the founder event uh, can vary depending on the organisms and whether that's a significant event or not really depends on the biology. Birds, for instance, tend to see uh, uh, geographic barriers as being much less consequential than uh, insects would say, small insects. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about um, allopatric speciation. Before I get to sympatric speciation, I want to talk a little bit about what prevents species from coming back together again. So remember, just to remind you, we're going with the biological species concept, which, me, which says that individuals from different populations are, are, are individuals are from different species if they can't interbreed and form fertile offspring. So you have this, this bit about how do you prevent uh, offspring from being prevented, uh, being formed in the first place. And there's two different, barrier, two different mechanisms that we'll discuss. Some sorts of barriers we're, we're going to call, we're going to term prezygotic barriers. These are barriers that, that prevent zygotes, you know, the fusion of, of egg and sperm from being formed in the first place. So what types of, of barriers might, be, what might we term prezygotic? Well, behavior is one prezygotic isolating mechanism. You can imagine that um, natural selection can operate quite strongly on individuals from making the wrong choice in terms of mating. If you make the wrong choice, that's a very deadly mistake in terms of your reproduction, because you're, you're forming offspring that themselves can't reproduce, perhaps. So natural selection often will favor differences in mating behavior that would make it so that this, such that you know, organisms won't recognize each other as being from the same, same, same species. If you look at birds, they often have very elaborate courtship dances, and those courtship dances are specific to, to you know, individual species. Okay? And the same goes for insects and other organisms as well. There's, there's behavioral differences that isolate one, one group from another, and natural selection probably plays a strong role in causing those isolating mechanisms. You can also have um, habitat uh, isolation or temporal uh, isolation. So maybe, for instance, 
Maybe, for instance, the, the mating season is different in the two different populations of two different species. So even though they might, in theory, might have found each other attractive, that they never actually bump into each other because their mating seasons are at different times. Or once again, maybe they're um, mating on, in different habitats or slight, maybe different fruits. We'll give it examples of that. But there's all sorts of, of isolating mechanisms, behavioral and otherwise, that can cause organisms to um, not form zygotes or not, not mate in the first place. Oh, and one last thing I should mention is kind of an obvious one, mechanical. I'll give an example in, in a bit when I bring the board down or the screen down. You know, there, there's often cases where there's sort of a, so for me, a lock and key mechanism that prevents um, copulation from occurring in the first place. Some of the most rapidly evolving traits in many organisms are the genitalia. So for instance, in flies, I mentioned last lecture that most aspects of the fly from different species, you know, amateurs or even experts can't use most features of flies to distinguish species. What they end up doing is they turn the males over and they look at their genitalia. And that's the, the surefire way of identifying one species versus another in many species of flies. So there's also mechanical isolation as well. Now, the w I actually got the same question independently twice um, last time uh, after the lecture, which is, well, how about chihuahuas and Great Danes, okay? And um, clear <laughs> clearly, I, mean, I think people would, would consider chihuahuas and Great Danes as um, the same species, even though uh, they're probably mechanically isolated one from the other. Um, but the, the idea here is that you would still have gene flow between the between chihuahua, the, the breed of chihuahuas, and Great Danes, but it would have to be, I imagine, through intermediate breeds of intermediate size, all right? But um, just if that's if that's something you're thinking about, um, you know, we're, we're thinking about uh, it, it is a it's a mechanism that's not necessarily going to be a, an isolating mechanism, but one that's often associated with an isolating mechanism. Okay, but anyways, here's some examples of prezygotic uh, isolating mechanisms. Now you might imagine, you know, everything comes in twos or threes in the world. It seems so. In this case, there's a you have a prezygotic. You can probably guess that there's also postzygotic isolating mechanism. And these are mechanisms that cause the, so now, so the act has occurred, you've had fertilization of the, of, of the egg by the sperm, and so the question is, what, are, what, you know, what happens next? Do we, have, um, do we have the formation of an individual that's, fertily, that's fertile? That is, that is to say, even though you've made the mistake, the offspring is fertile? If that's the case, if, if you can actually form fertile offspring from a mating from two different populations or two different species, then the argument here would be that the isolating mechanisms aren't very strong and that maybe those two species, those two populations can come back together sometime in the future. Because the isolating mechanisms, if you can actually form fertile offspring, then the, then the, the offspring, the, the, the isolating mechanisms aren't, aren't very strong and that you can la excuse me, later have these populations merge into, into one another and you won't have the formation of species. So these postzygotic mechanisms often involve genetic mechanisms that cause um, the offspring either to die, that is to say that they, they never actually, you, know, you have partial development, but then the, then the zygote, the embryo dies, or that you have um, infertile offspring being, being produced. So the hybrids are infertile. And I'm not going to go into great detail about postzygotic isolating mechanisms. I'm going to talk about one genetic model for how um, postzygotic isolation can occur. Okay, and the model I'm going to talk about is the dobzhansky muller model. It's a dobzhansky muller model of incompatibilities. And to introduce this model, I'm going to first show you a wrong model. All right, so I don't want you to remember the wrong model, but I want to see you to get the idea. So the idea here is we have two different species, and we're going to think about one locus. We're going to think about one genetic locus, which we'll call the big A locus. So we have big A, big A here. And let's imagine that along one of these species, or one of these populations, we still have big A, big A, that there's no mutations, all the individuals are homozygous for the big A allele. Let's imagine somewhere along this lineage we have the origination of a little A allele, and that that little A allele later becomes fixed. 
So one mechanism, the wrong mechanism, is that when you think about the hybrids being formed between these two different species, of course they all have to be heterozygous, right? Because all these guys are homozygous big A, all these guys are homozygous little a. When you have a, a hybrid form, they have to be heterozygous for the, for the big A, little a alleles. True? Okay. So the wrong model states that there's something wrong with these heterozygous individuals, that for whatever reasons, the heterozygous individuals have a lower fitness than either the homozygous states. Okay. What's wrong with that model? Does anybody see the flaw? Yes. You couldn't get this state in the first place. Very good. So what it means is that natural selection would have had to go down an adaptive valley, right? That in order to get the, if, if these guys are, have a lower fitness, right, the, the hybrids, then, then these guys, this intermediate form in this population also must have had an intermediate lower fitness as well, right? And so it's very difficult then to explain how this population on the right could have even gone through this heterozygous state if, if the fitnesses were, were lower, because natural selection wouldn't, wouldn't allow that, would not favor that. Okay, so anyways, that's why this model is wrong. But it, the reason I'm showing you this model is because we're starting to think about alleles in loci. So the, the dubchansky muller model, the one we think is, is a correct model, and there's some evidence that's starting to accumulate of examples of dubchansky muller genes, it's a two-locus model. You think about two different loci that might be coding for two different proteins. Uh, so we'll make our population again. We have, let me see. I'm going to erase the top part here so I can make the tree a little bit taller. So let's put this right here. We're going to have two loci the A locus and the B locus. In, in our example, the ancestor will be homozygous for the big A allele and also homozygous for the big B allele. Okay. Now these, these, these two, the proteins that are coded for these two different genes, they might interact one, one with the other. So you may be familiar with this, but um, proteins often interact, actually physically contact one another to either perform important enzymatic functions or to make structures in the cell. Okay, so that's, you know, that's what proteins do. They do things with other proteins. So we're imagining perhaps that A and B, these two loci, the gene products of, the, of these, uh, the proteins produced by A and B actually interact. So let's imagine that on the left side, we have, um, let's see, I don't want to do this. We have a change in this locus here in the A locus, so that we have little a and big B over here. Okay, now, this can, be a, this, this can be a perfectly fine transition. Okay, so you have this little a allele arise, and the only thing that's asked of this little a allele is that it works, that it works with the big B allele. All right, if it does, it's fine. Okay? Now, on this side, we're going to have the opposite occur. So we're going to have big A, big A, but we're going to have a mutation that causes a big B allele to become a little b allele, and then later we're going to have big A, big A, little b, little b over here. Okay? Once again, we're not asking anything too difficult of the little b allele. All it ever has to do is work with the big A allele. Now what happens when the hybrids form here? What are they going to be? Well, by necessity, hybrids are going to be big A, little a, big B, little b. The point here is that there's some allele combinations. For instance, the big A, the little a allele, has it ever seen the little b allele in its entire evolutionary history? No, it's never seen each other. It, what the geneticists would say is that little a and little b have never been tested with each other. Okay? There's no guarantee that the little a and the little b alleles will work with one another. That is to say, they, if they're performing some enzymatic activity, there's no guarantee that they'll continue to carry on that enzymatic activity. Or if they form some structure in a cell, there's no guarantee that, that the structure will be the same. Okay? Now, you, you're probably saying to yourself, well, how about big A and big B? They work down here. But the point is that you're going to have some, some protein interactions that are normal and some that aren't. And so the, the dubjonsky muller model of genetic incompatibility says that the, the incompatibility is between these, these mutations that have never, these alleles that have never been tested, and they break something that was formerly working. Okay, and so the hybrids, when you break something that was formerly working, the, the organism, the hybrid organism is less fit. It's either dead, that is, it's a lethal hybrid, and, the, and because of these incompatibilities, uh, normal development can't occur, or for whatever reasons, it has a lower fitness, or it can't produce fertile offspring. 
So that's the dobzhansky muller model. Um, I'm not going to give you any specific examples, but there's probably about a dozen of these examples now um, out in the literature. Okay, so they're of, and usually involving fruit flies. And they're actually pretty complicated um, experiments to actually show these, these Dobjonsky and Muller incompatibilities uh, in, in real life. But this is the leading model for how, you know, a po of a post-zygotic mechanism that keeps species from uh, forming hybrids. Okay, it's the, the hybrids that are less fit or they don't work for some reason. And that keeps populations, species from coming back together. Are there any questions about that? So, so the, so when you add third or more loci, I mean the, the population genetics theory that people have devel developed that goes along with this model tends to have what's called a snowball effect. And so that as you, that these dobzhansky muller incompatibilities as one arises and the second arises more rapidly and the third, so you really get a very rapid uh, uh, evolution of more and more incompatibilities that causes the species to, s to remain separate. So that's the, I mean, you, you can add in a third or fourth locus, but it's not like you're going to help things out. You make it only worse. Any other questions? That was a good question. Yes. So, so the Sometimes. And so what I've avoided in this lecture and what I'm going to avoid is speciation in plants, where there's a mechanism of speciation called polyploid speciation where in plants you can have um, individuals from different species forming hybrids that are themselves are perfectly fine and are genetically incompatible with the two parental species. So it's almost like instant speciation. It's, a, it's quite complicated and I decided last year not to talk about polyploid speciation because I, I spent hours and hours going over it, but it's actually quite fascinating and, um, and worth, I, mean, I can give you the literature if you're interested in, in finding out more about it. Your book discusses polyploid speciation as well. But yes, sometimes that can happen. The, the hybrids can actually be new species themselves, and that's the, a common mechanism of species, species formation in plants. Are there good questions? I mean, those, these are good questions. Any others? I think what I want to do is go back to the screen and give some examples. Well, I don't forget. So here's um, the Pacific Ocean, big place as you know, and I'm just focusing my attention on the on the Hawaiian Islands, and um, I'll have a more detailed map, but. You may be aware that the Hawaiian Islands are a series of islands, with the biggest being the, oldest, uh, being the youngest down here, which is Hawaii. And then as you go along this chain of islands, the islands tend to become older and older. Uh, you know, Kauai, for instance, is quite a bit older than Hawaii. Uh, and and the, the idea here is that, well, is that the, the, the continental crust is moving over a hot spot. So you always have uh, the southernmost island is, is the one that's being actively formed, and in fact, further off, further south of Hawaii is another mound that hasn't broken the surface but is the now more active and growing you know, future uh, part of that archipelago. But here's an example. That there's lots of examples on Hawaii and other uh, isolated islands like that of, uh, of radiations of a similar type of organism. So here's honey creepers, some of which are, are already extinct, but these are honey creepers, a type of bird that, that occurs on the, on the Hawaiian islands. Uh, you've had a, a large number of these things. All these birds are each other's closest relatives, which suggests that they all formed from a single ancestral species that somehow made it to the island, okay, and then radiated. And you've got a, a radiation in, in form, so you have some of these uh, honey creepers specialize on, on breaking seeds. Typically, seed eaters have these thick feet uh, and short beaks, versus others that are nectar feeders, I believe. Or, or insectivores, but you've had this radiation of honey creepers on the Galapagos Islands, or on the Hawaiian Islands. This is one example of a, of a radiation on the island. There's also been radiations of, of major radiation in fruit flies on the, on the uh, Hawaiian Islands. And here's another example of a, of a radiation uh, of, a, of organisms. This is a this is an example of the, these rift lakes in um, uh, in East Africa. Uh, here's Lake Malawi, for instance. And in these lakes, you've had 
a radiation of, of fish called cichlid fish. Okay? And each, these lakes can actually contain you know, 100 or more species of cichlids. And the idea here is that these lakes, although you know, looking at a map, of course, they look like they might a uniform habitat, but they're, they're actually quite um, heterogeneous. Not, al not only do you have heterogeneity along the shores, but the, the environment can be partitioned by depth. So you have some cichlids that, that specialize to live in the water column versus others that are along the shores or in the deeper parts of the water, the, of the lake. So you've had this radiation of, of cichlid fish uh, in these lakes that's probably driven partially at least by allopatric speciation, okay, divisions of populations up in, into smaller populations. And this is a new word, actually. I've used this word a couple times now, adaptive radiation. So biologists often use the word adaptive radiation when they're speaking about uh, an especially diverse or speciose part of the tree. Okay, so there are some parts of the, of the tree of life where you see more species that seem to have occurred at a higher rate. So the species formation seems to have occurred at a higher rate. Cichlid fish are the classic example of an adaptive radiation where in a relatively short amount of time, you've had many, many species form. Um, it's often the case that um, these adaptive radiations uh, appear to be linked to some trait. And the question then becomes is that, did the evolution of that trait somehow uh, help or, or cause the adaptive radiation? Okay. And often, too, like in, in the cichlid fish, there's other factors that are probably contributing to the adaptive radi radiation, such as sexual selection. So. Um, Female choice might also be playing a, a large role in, in causing that adaptive radiation. Okay, let's go on. Uh, here's an example of an allopatric speciation event um, of, of what are called stomatopods across the Isthmus of Panama. So. There's lots of examples, including these guys, of, um, of species pairs, that called, uh, you know, sister species, where here's your isthmus of Panama, there's the Panama Canal, but you have one species here and another species here, and these two species are each other's closest relatives. Okay? So you have lots of pairs of species just like that. And here's an example from stomatopods uh, that was described by Knowlton in 1993. And here's an example of um, a, you know, variation in the genitals of, of Drosophila, uh, once again sort of referring to this me mechanical isolation that can occur in many species. It's one reproductive isolating mechanism. It can't do it, so to speak. Now, <coughs> it, th there's some examples, you know, experimental examples of how uh, isolation can occur just based on natural selection. Okay, so. This is a classic experiment uh, by Diane Dodd that was occurred, that was performed, or published rather, in 1989. And the, the basic experiment was this. And you probably know that you can take bottles, you stopper them, and you can put some fruit flies in there. There's the fruit fly, right? And typically what they do is at the bottom of these bottles, they put some sort of food source. Okay, sometimes, I mean, I'm not a Drosophila geneticist, but Remember, you know, they go into these labs, they smell of bananas because bananas is one of the food sources. But what Diane Dodd did is she um, basically had some food so sources had a starch base for the sugar, and then she also had bottles of flies where the food source was maltose. Okay? Two, different, two different sugar sources. And she basically passaged flies uh, from one bottle to another for eight generations on the starch-based medium. And then she also did four replicate experiments over here where she passaged for eight generations flies from one fly bottle to an the next on the maltose-based uh, medium. Okay. So she let these guys go uh, independently for eight, eight generations. Now the first thing she could do is she could ask, well, this is only eight generations, but at the end of this experiment, you have to remember the flies were all from the same bottle when she started these off, all right? So she just took one bottle of flies and split them into eight bottles. And she asked, after eight generations, 
could she detect any genetic differences between these different fly lines, these different eight bottles? And she did. So she, using a, a technique that nobody really uses anymore called starch gel electrophoresis, she was able to detect differences in proteins in these different flies, probably caused by natural selection or selection operating differently in these, these different flies, selecting for flies that grew well on starch versus maltose. But interestingly, she also found differences in the female choice uh, after eight generations. So what she did is she took uh, females that were grown, say, on the starch, um, in the starch bottles and took them from a male that was on a starch or maltose, and she asked, how often does the female choose males from the that were grown on the same medium versus different? And so this is, an, this is the, the experimental outcome. She found that the females actually were choosy. They preferred the males that lived on the, that were grown on the same on the same medium, and so you can also do the, the reciprocal experiment. You take the maltose females and ask, does she do these females that were grown in the maltose bottles? Do they prefer males from the starch bottles or the maltose bottles? And they preferred the maltose bottles. So what you're seeing is the evolution of choosiness in the females as well to prefer males that were grown in a similar habitat. Okay. She also did experiments, the, the control experiment, which is you take uh, females from uh, the same starch bottle and made them with males from the same starch bottle or uh, take, you know, try to make females that came from one starch bottle and see if they, they preferred or, or didn't prefer males from a different starch bottle. And the control experiment wasn't conclusive or there were no significant differences. So the, the, the conclusion is that there was a significant difference here when you, with, with the only factor being uh, the, the uh, sugar source in the, in the um, in the, in the bottle. So this is a, a, an experiment that's been repeated multiple times in an even different species. Yes? Probably behavioral differences is the idea. But the female, I mean, it's hard for us to tell, but the flies can tell. So for whatever, whatever the females are picking up on, that it's significant to them, okay? So you know, it's, it's the ta classic thing where in the biological species concept, in a sense, you're you're letting the individuals themselves determine whether they're different species. So sometimes we can't really determine any traits or, or see behavioral differences ourselves, but the organisms themselves certainly are picking up on something significant. In this case, that's the case as well. Okay. Um, so now I want to turn to the, the last thing I haven't talked about, which is Sympatric speciation. So sympatric speciation is speciation that occurs within the range of the population. So it's like you have overlapping populations, and yet you still have divergence in those two populations. So they're not geographically separated, um, but, but they nonetheless undergo speciation. And the example I'm going to give is with a, a ragolitus, a type of fly. It's an it's a agricultural pest. And um, this is a case, many of these examples of sympatric speciation occur when the organisms are, have a lot of fidelity to um, a particular, say, uh, food source. And so in this case with, the, um, with ragolitis, is what you have is you have, uh, well, ancestral, you have a hawthorn fruit. And what happens is these males, um, well, here's a male. The males hang out around these fruit, and they wait for a female to come. Uh, the females are going to lay their eggs, oviposit, on these fruits. So the female comes along. Here's the female. I guess they have eyelashes. <laughs> There's the female. The, the female's coming here. She's going to mate with the males. The, remember, the males are hanging out around these hawthorn fruits. The female mates with the male, and then she lays her eggs. There's the eggs on the hawthorn fruit. And then, of course, what happens is these eggs hatch, and they spoil the fruit, which if it's a hawthorn tree, I guess we don't really care. But they spoil the fruit. Uh, the larvae grow, and then they have fidelity to the same host. So they remember that they're on a hawthorn, and that they, the males, for instance, will return to the hawthorn to hang out, buzz around the hawthorn fruit, and the females will remember to oviposit. Okay? Now, historically, about 100 years ago, at least some of these uh, ragolitis made a mistake. Okay, and they started to hang out not around hawthorn fruits, but around uh, things like apples. Okay, this is when they became an agricultural pest. 
because when the females oviposited their eggs on the, on the apples, they spoiled the apples. And of course, the, the people that raised apples were not happy about that. So they, they all of a sudden, the ragolitis, which weren't on anybody's radar, were suddenly classified as a pest, okay? But the point is, um, you had at least some individuals change their preference. Now the point is that the individuals, so here you have another group of, of flies, here's an apple. You have another group of flies buzzing around the apples, ragolitis buzzing around the apples, mating, the males hanging around the apples, the females laying their eggs in the apples. These individuals can, you know, in terms of uh, the ragolitis, they, can might, they might pass each other in, in the same orchard, right? You can imagine this guy's name is Sam, his, here's Ralph. They could be passing each other, say, hi, Sam, and the other guy says, hi, Ralph. This guy goes to the apple, this guy goes and male, mates with the females on the, on the hawthorn. They, they never actually, you know, gene flow between these populations of the, the guys that live on the apples, mate around the apples, and the ones that mate and oviposit on the hawthorn fruit, they're reproductively isolated, even though they might buzz by one another in the same orchard. Okay, so this is an example of sympatric speciation because they buzz by one another. There's nothing in principle keeping these guys from mating with these guys except for the fact that they're you know, behaviorally isolated. So that's the story with the ragolitis. Um, it turns out that, uh, like I mentioned, this switch to apples and some other uh, agricultural things like cherries and pears occurred about 100 years ago. It's a big pest now. You do have what's called assortative mating. So this is an example of assortative mating where the Apple males and females only mate with one another, and the uh, hawthorn males and females only mate with one another. So this assortative mating is causing uh, gene flow to be, cop uh, to be turned off. And today, after only 100 years, you have two races. The apple hawthorns are genetically uh, different one from the other using uh, sort of a method that can detect um, genetic differences. And they've also been able to now document other differences between the hawthorn and the apple populations. Um, for instance, the developmental time is different, uh, 40 versus 60 days for the, the hawthorn uh, maggot. So this is, a, is an example of perhaps incipient speciation occur, occurring in a sympatric way. All right, so I think that is where, well, I know that's where I'm going to stop for today. Um, we'll pick up uh, with phylogen phylogenetic methods next time.